Yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, great to see uh, a lot of people attending this, uh, this press briefing. Um, I'm uh, Scott Griffin from the National Press Institute in Vienna. We are based in Vienna. We're a global press freedom organization, a membership network made up of editors, uh, media executives, and leading journalists. Uh, and we're extremely fortunate to have uh, Marisa as, as one of our global board members. Um, and uh, as, as you can all imagine, uh, the reason that we are here and uh, is, is to talk about uh, the pending cases against Maria. Um, and I'll just give a brief introduction uh, to that and then uh, let her away and then move to questions. Just to give you an idea of how we plan to do this over the next uh, hour or so, let's say. And uh, first, I, I also want to thank Marie and Ted for obviously taking it to join us uh, at what is a, a late hour in, in the Philippines. So thank you for that. Um, but what, what, what we plan to do is uh, uh, I'll give a brief intro and, and ask Marie and Ted to kind of give us a little bit of background about this case um, for which the verdict is coming up on, on Monday. Uh, and then, uh, uh, we want to give lots of time to the journalists who are here participating to, to ask questions. Um, and I think uh, uh, right now people's cameras and mics are, are off, uh, but when you have a question, there's no problem. I think from our side, uh, we can turn your mic and camera on uh, so you can ask the question yourself. Um, and so in order to do that, I would suggest you can either uh, raise your hand raise your virtual hand, but I think what might be easier uh, is to just put your name in the chat and just mention that you, that you have a question that you would like to ask. Uh, and, then, uh, and then myself or one of my colleagues will just will activate your, uh, your voice and, and camera or just the voice, whichever you prefer uh, in the end. Um, and then just, just one other note there, uh, that uh, yeah, conversation is, is in principle on the record. Um, unless, of course, uh, Maria or, or Ted says otherwise. Um, and uh, we are uh, recording it as well. Um, and uh, we, may, uh, we may put some, uh, some or all of the conversation posted online afterwards, depending on, um, on the discussion we have with, with Maria afterwards, whether how, how we see about that. But just to let everyone know about that, that in principle things are on the record, so feel free to quote unless, as it's, uh, someone mentions otherwise. Um, yeah, so just uh, just a very brief introduction. As you all know, uh, Maria and, and Rappler have been the target of uh, of a great deal of harassment over the past few years for their reporting in the Philippines, um, and and Maria is facing a number of cases. I believe the count is nine or possibly eight now. I think. Um, cases, eight uh, cases against her at the moment. Uh, and one of those cases is coming up for a verdict on Monday, June 15th. This is a, a cyber libel case. Uh, and just so you people understand, I think the dimension of, the, of, of what you are facing, Maria, is that the, the combined uh, cases, I think you're facing around up to 100 years in prison if you just look at, at the numbers, which is, which is very difficult to even imagine. Um, so that's a little bit of the dimension of what you're facing and really um, absurd accusations uh, and, and as IPI has been uh, saying for, for a long time, part of an effort what we see to, to harass you, to harass to silence critical media in the Philippines uh, and, and of course it's not just Rappler, other, other media as well have been, television media of course as we saw recently with ABS um, but uh, but in particular, you have been you have been targeted for your work. So, uh, what I think would be great to start with, Maria, is if you could just give us a little bit of background uh, about you know the general situation, but also this particular case against you. What is it, what what it's about? What the background is? Uh, and as I said, uh, a little bit about the, the verdict coming up on Monday. So, thanks a lot. No, no, no. Thank you, and thank you everybody for taking the time to uh, to come and listen is, you know, there's so much going on in our world today. Um, I guess first, like, you know, the, the verdict, uh, every time uh, Amal Clooney and Keelan Gallagher call me, they're the head of our international legal team. Every time they call me, the, the number of, 
of years that the cumulative cases, the maximum penalty seems to increase. The most recent one is 104 years because it's the interpretation of the law. But but Ted will always point out to me, you know, it's 104 years, but uh, underneath our rules, the, the, the who you would ever have to serve, regardless of how many cases thrown at you, is 40 years, right? So I'm like going, okay, well, Ted, okay, that's okay, 40 years. But anyway, let, let me just... Ted is brilliant. He is, you know, a former Supreme Court spokesman. He is with the Free Legal Assistance Group. He's been, he's one of the top human rights lawyers here. So I, th I will let him handle most of the details of this case. But I just want to lay out what we're facing uh, and what has changed. Many of you are, are probably tired of us now because uh, this, a lot of these things with Rappler began four years ago in 2016 with the exponential attacks. And then, yes, part of the reason the number of cases keep changing is because in 2018, there were 11 cases and investigations. And then I, the arrest warrants came out and I posted the eight charges eight different times. Um, I want to point out what's different and why this is critical also, because we don't know what to really expect. The first is the pandemic. It's just changed everything drastically. This verdict was supposed to have been April 3rd, and it's been. This is one of the first cases that will be in a quarantine courtroom. And I worry about that because then, you know, it's also uh, while the court is open, a lot of proceedings are still being done virtually, but we are going to have to appear in court on Monday. I think, you know, Ted hasn't been out of the house. I mean, we've, I've tried to avoid, we have a very tough quarantine. Uh, lockdown in the Philippines. So that's the first. Um, there have been uh, tens of thousands of arrests uh, to that lockdown. And uh, I think the, the difficulty with the quarantine rules is that for people in the courtroom is cut down. So the number of reporters, for example, who can be there is cut down to three. No observers allowed, uh, the, the accused and the lawyers. Ted can go into it more. I think that the second part is that the unthinkable, the only time ABS-CBN, the largest broadcaster in the Philippines, uh, on May 5th, it was shut down. That's unthinkable to us at this point in time, right? But it was shut down during a time when no one could leave their home. Um, and very similar to Rappler, uh, a minor regulatory agency gives a shutdown order. With us, it was the SEC. With ABS-CBN, it was the NTC. And in January 2018, we, our license to operate was revoked, right? We're still fighting that in court, uh, one of the eight cases. And then finally, the last one, and I, and I, the irony, of course, is I had the in the Philippines on the new anti-terror law. Is that this morning? Maybe yesterday morning. Yes, uh, we have a new anti-terror bill uh, that is just waiting for President Duterte to hit this essentially could turn any government critic into a terrorist. And they're all context and smack in the middle of it on Monday, cyber alarm. And let me turn it over to, to Ted and shut, let me shut off my messaging apps. Uh, let me turn it over to Ted for you uh, more about. Yeah, uh, thanks Maria. And thank you everyone for being here. Just a very quick, maybe, uh recap or a summary uh well th this involves uh a an article that was an, a news item that was published on rappler initially in 2012 and uh it was republished i put it in quotes because that's the theory of the prosecution it was allegedly republished in 2014 and that those two particular dates are important because that's central to the theory of the prosecution the problem with the 2012 publication uh, for the prosecution was uh, the period for the offense had already lapsed. In, in the Philippines, libel has a prescriptive period of one year. And uh, because they now allege that uh, Rappler republished the, the, the article in 2014, the period started to run. That's the first theory. The second theory is because of the republication, uh, you could file any time. That is the dangerous part of the case because uh, in the Philippines, we don't yet have a theory of republication as a basis for liability for offenses 
uh, committed online. Her cyber crime protection law was passed only in 12. And that was the only time that libel as a felony suddenly was transformed into a cyber offense in 2012. And so uh, this is probably one of the first few cases to actually proceed uh, to its conclusion involving a journalist. Uh, there have been prosecutions for cyber libel, but this, this would involve you know, ordinary persons posting on the internet. But this is probably one of the first few cases that would involve a journalist that would uh, conclude uh, from, from start to finish. And so uh, this, this verdict is pretty important uh, for those reasons. First, if, if the judge finds that there is basis for liability, the judge is not simply saying that uh, the accused here committed cyber libel. The judge would effectively be saying that republication, uh, particularly for an online medium, is now an accepted fact in terms of the law. And so that now creates you know, serious implications for, for online media. Uh, essentially, uh, because those articles can stay online forever, essentially that means that you could have multiple uh, prosecutions. Uh, and so the prosecutions never stop. So uh, that, that is the entire point of the prosecution in its case. The, the, the three accused here, Maria, as the CEO and executive editor, uh, Ray Santos Jr., the writer, and Rappler itself as an entity, as a corporate entity, are, are responsible for republishing the allegedly defamatory article. And so those are, I think those are the stakes on Monday when we, when we listen to the verdict. Uh, if the judge finds liability, essentially the judge would have to say that we now are accepting occasion. Of course, that is... If that happens, of course, we're going to, you know, challenge it all the way to the sport. Uh, but then that is, that is a significant step uh, taken by the trial court. So that's why uh, our, our arguments really focused on that. We, our argument really was republication may apply uh, as a theory of liability for print because it's pretty clear that if you do republish a defamatory article, there might have been an intent there. But for online publications, republication, uh, you know, poses its own set of dangers. So, so those are the stakes. Not just the, not just the penalty, in, uh, because here, the, the possible range of penalty is up to maybe seven years and change. But it's not just the penalty in years. Uh, not to say that that isn't serious, that you would, you know, they would sentence uh, two journalists to, to a term of imprisonment. But it's also the, the on, on the law, meaning this judge would basically be saying that uh, republication is, is accepted. And, and that, hasn't been, that hasn't been pronounced yet uh, in, ter in a cyber law case. Too much now. Yeah, thank you very much, Ted. So I, understand, I think I understand that the point is, yeah, that on the one hand, of course, there is Maria is facing a, a quite a large penalty, but also the precedent being the possible precedent being set by this case is is extremely is extremely uh, worrying. Um, maybe I don't know if, if Maria or Ted you would like to do this, um, but just you know, as as we know, there are eight cases pending against you and Rappel. If you could just give us a brief overview of of these different cases. And where this one lies, of, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the other cases or cyber ever cases. So which type of cases they are? If you could just give us a very brief, um, as I said, overview of that. Sure. I, I mean, I can do that. Ted, Ted handles this, but of course, Ted also knows our cases, right? Um, uh, so cyber libel is kind of a liar. It was the one that moved the fast? Uh, I think our is very professional. She types her own, her own, uh, um, her orders herself while the cases are ongoing. So the, she moved very, and uh, this 
is the only cyber libel case. We did have a case for libel that has already been, uh, that we won. It was thrown out of court. So that, that's, that's something that's happened in the last year. Um, and then aside from that, there are three charges of tax evasion. Um, there are charges of uh, foreign ownership, uh, violating foreign ownership rules. You know, this is the mother case, the SEC case, the Securities and Exchange Commission, that went up to the Court of Appeals and now has been remanded back to the SEC. Um, and then finally, what else did I miss? Foreign ownership, uh, uh, tax evasion. I think that's it. <laughs> Broad strokes. Anti, anti area is it? An, uh, yes. Is there an anti dummy case? Which is part of the foreign ownership. Yeah. So there, there's actually two or three. Um, you know, the, our our international lawyers will actually characterize them only in three buckets. Uh, there's a bunch on foreign ownership. Two of those cases uh, involved all severs of the board of directors of Rappler. They all give arrest uh, warrants and um, and. That case now has actually been remanded back to the to the prosecutor. So that's also, I suppose, we're making some progress. Uh, the other libel case has been thrown out. That's it. So it's tax evasion, this cyber libel, and then foreign ownership. Um, I think one other thing that stands out for me about this cyber libel case is that uh, the National Bureau in, of Investigation's own lawyers threw it out at the very beginning. And that was because it seemed so ridiculous. Uh, again, the period of prescription that Ted talked about. But then uh, it was resuscitated and then forwarded on to the Department of Justice. And I suppose this is one sign for you why it seems to be clearly targeted against you that it was you know, resuscitated and, uh, yeah, and brought back. Oh. I mean, the pattern is very clear, especially if you add ABS-CBN on there. But, you know, in one year, in about 12 in 14 months, we had 11 cases on investigations. So those 11 cases all went through. And then that was 2018. We had a, a pretty hellish 2018. And then in 2019, the arrests began. You know, arrest warrants were issued. And that came down to eight times of posting bail for me and for Rappler. So yes, pattern, definite pattern. I mean, uh, I, I always say, you know, I have done nothing wrong that I haven't done in almost 35 years of being a journalist. Uh, thanks, thanks, Maria. Just want to now uh, maybe uh, if you have uh, start maybe with the questions uh, from the participants. As I said, I think it would be best if you either uh, raise your hand or type your name uh, into the into the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I see one already. We have Pontus Alkvist from uh, Swedish news agency TT. Uh, I'll ask my colleague uh, to uh, turn on your mic and, and cam, Pontus, so you can ask your questions. Mm. All right, we can hear. I think we can hear you now. Excellent. No, I can. Hi. Um, hi from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, two questions, actually, for you, um, uh, Ressa. Um, how, first of all, how confidence in the independence of the judicial system of the Philippines? And the second question would be. Uh, how do you feel about the risk of being uh, sent to jail for the publication of this um, article in uh, 2012? Thank you. Thanks. You start with the easy questions. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, just take a look. Last, last week, the UN uh, Commission on, High Commission on Human Rights, uh, OHCR, uh, came out with a report on the Philippines that was uh, pretty in its in its uh, verdict, right? Um, we've during lockdown, we've had uh, your many news organizations have written about how the Philippines has had one of the longest and most militarily driven lockdowns. And uh, during that time period, almost sixty thousand people have been arrested, um, and uh, there have been lots of complaints about uneven and unequal. Uh, implementation of the law. So somebody who is uh, 
a person on the street could be stopped, a group or gathering of people could be arrested, and yet our police chief uh, could uh, have a birthday party with, or a mananita, which is the Philippine one. So a long-winded answer, right? But um, I suppose what I would say is this, since I am, have submitted myself to the judges who are handling our cases, uh, we have gone through the uh, presenting our case, especially in this one. So I, I leave you to look at the full context of the Philippines and then say that we've always depended on the, the judges to actually move away from any kind of political pressure to exert their uh, decision on um, the spirit of the law. And I'm hoping for that. One of, of uh, how do I feel about facing for doing my job, you know, uh, it's been four years that, that we've been under attack for doing our jobs. I, I think this is a, not an easy time to be a journalist, but I think that the mission of journalism has become more important today than ever. Early on, when the lockdown was, um, was implemented in the Philippines, that's in March, I wrote a piece for Time where I just, all around the world, leaders were getting tremendous powers because of the pandemic. And I was hope, I, but the title of the piece is, Don't Let the Virus Infect Democracy. So I didn't answer your question. How do I feel? I, I gave um, the commencement speech at Princeton University to the class of 20. And I gave three advice uh, in that speech. And one of them is something I took to heart because, and part of the reason I included it is because I was going through it. Whatever it is you're most afraid of, you have to touch it, hold it, and embrace it. So I embrace my fear. And by embracing my fear, I can take the sting out because frankly, it's a, it's a mix, right? It's a mix of facing great power of the state, fear, yes, but also anger that, uh, I have done nothing wrong, but do my job. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Pontus. Um, I see we have a raised hand from Eric uh, Wissart. Um, I'll ask my colleagues also to, to switch you on. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Maria. How are you? Hello, Eric. I like Hi, this. You, you, all my friends are here. No. Hi, Eric. I just left the FCC, so we're at the Press Freedom Committee of the FCC, actually. We had a meeting tonight. So, so how are you? Good, good. So, so um, great to see you again. Concerned about the upcoming judgments, but I just wanted to ask you... Um, you know, ABS, CBN, and all the work you've done with Rappler, and I know Ellen and um, uh, the Verifiles, does that have a resonance with the people in the Philippines? And, you know, I've been in the Philippines a lot in the last three or four years. People were fed up with the drug crime and all the rest of it. And so people really buy into the Duterte thing. Heart you know, just as people buy into tr Trump. So, you know, we support uh, the, as a, you know, see, you know, for the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondents Club, sorry. Obviously, Maria has spoken to us many times. She's a great supporter and friend of us. But is this reaching down to people in the Philippines or are we in our ivory towers? <laughs> This one, do you mind if I give it first to Ted and I'll do a quick response to you, Eric? <laughs> you know why? Yeah, I else, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it reaching down, Ted? Uh, okay, it's a pretty <laughs> tough question, but def definitely since 2016, and I think you, you said you've been to the Philippines a few times, and Definitely, sixteen. There has been a, you know, there, there's been a lot of, I would call it myth making. You know, uh, the the narrative, the narrative that's being 
deployed really you know uh he's a president who's really you know disciplined who's putting law and order he has political will he gets things done and so that's that's a narrative they 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 bought into and so that's that's what that's what uh organizations these organizations like rappler would have to 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 go against it's it's difficult for the ordinary person the the you know the the those in the lower income brackets who have been waiting for so long to to relate to you know to bad news and so when 2016 came in and uh, he won uh president Duterte won on 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 his image of of you know being a tough guy of having political will of being uh, you know someone who gets things done who's a law and order person who is disciplined uh, who talks straight make empty promises you know? so it's difficult for a news organization to go up against that and to say look you know the the emperor isn't wearing any clothes so and that's i think that's what the uh, organizations have been going up against and so has it sunk in i think it it did and that's why his uh, uh ratings his popularity continues to be high because he does know how to you know uh appeal to to the to the larger demographic one thing though that and, and this is a this opinion that i i've i've seen during this pandemic when we had a lockdown that was 78 days long uh one thing I did notice here was that during that time, his appeal to the to the lower income bracket, I think, diminished. They were no longer happy to his word because he himself was saying, "I don't know what to do. You know, I am helpless. I have all of this uh, uh, money at at my disposal, but I don't know what to do." So, so I think uh, whatever whatever he he got. In 2016, from the from the image that came in during the elections, uh, the 78 day lockdown, I think, basically diminished that. And so, yeah, has it has did it sink in? Yes, it did. But I I I think you're seeing a little bit, you know, a little bit of the erosion. He he go to his usual, you know, uh, menu of things. He cursed. He you know he he uses foul language a lot. He you know threatens people. He threatens with law. He threatens military power. But surprising, a lot of people tuned out. And I I I think Maria can can attest to this. But I, I think a lot of people tuned out. There wasn't any. There wasn't that much you know fear or apprehension. And to some extent, a lot of the people treated it treated his appearances you know with a lot of humor you know. People wanted. People were basically saying, "Okay, let me just you know, wait for the summary. I won't listen. I'll just wait for the summary." And and that's that's a very big difference from from when he took power in 2016. Eric, I think real I, the big difference now is uh, that President Duterte has to deliver, and that if the government doesn't deliver, it is life and death. And you have many Filipinos. Again, we've been locked down. This is our week 12, right? So eight, 70, 80 days, 70, how many days? 10, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of like the first thing. And then the second thing is the, the failures of government uh, are amplified by social media. And you know I will come to this, right? Uh, just this weekend, you had protests against the uh, hashtag junk terror bill against this bill in the Philippines in Cebu. Eight people were arrested, and those eight people found the next overnight uh, that they had cloned accounts on Facebook. And uh, and the next day, on Saturday and Sunday, we all woke up, and I I had I ran a script, and I had like. Maria dot Ressa down to nine six nine three right numbers. So this is uh, um, this is insane, and that one actually fear into people who are starting to speak up uh, because those cloned accounts were sending messages to their to the people that they're mimicking, right? And we we had, for example, uh, 
a 16-year-old high school campus journalist write a piece for Rappler. And, uh, and this person came under threatening attacks with private messages. So this is, that to me is, is so, but does it trickle down? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. Of course it does. Uh, but the narratives are strong. And I think that the narratives will remain. Uh, it's kind of like Trump in, in the U.S. In every country where social media has a foothold, uh, where most people get their news from, from social media, when that happens, you societies. Thanks. Um, if, that's, uh, if that's okay, Eric, or if you want to follow up, uh... Please feel free. Otherwise, uh, we have a question from, from Howard Johnson from, from BBC News. Um, Howard, feel free to jump on as well. Otherwise, I'll, I'll deliver uh, your question to Maria uh, in the chat, uh, which is, uh, yeah, whether you can flesh out, and maybe, maybe Ted, this is also for you, uh, to flesh out the timeline of the NBI initially throwing the case and then resuscitating it. So if you can just give it a bit more detail about that specific timeline. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, the the news item was published in twenty May, if I'm not mistaken. Within that period, uh, there were actually there was actually correspondence between between the complainant, Mr. Kang, and Rappler, but he didn't take any legal action. He took legal action uh, only in January twenty eighteen. Uh, and from January 2018, the NBI, the National Bureau of Investigation, particularly the Cybercrime Department, the one in charge of it. And in February 2018, that department dismissed the case. It was, it was a pretty comprehensively argued memorandum recommending to the director that there's no case, the crime has prescribed, there is no republication. In fact, uh, much, many of the authorities that the, the, the legal department of the Cybercrime Division cited were correct. Uh, they're actually the same authorities we cited. And so it went to the director uh, of the NBI. The NBI director did not agree and resuscitated it, uh, pushed it to the Department of Justice and because the NBI is operationally under the Department of Justice. And so the Department of Justice uh, agreed with the director saying that there is a case basically overturning the department which supposedly has expertise. We presume that why they're in the crime department is because they have expertise, they have training, not only on the technical side of it, but on the legal side of it. In fact, we, we, during the trial, we called that lawyer, the one who issued the memorandum, to, to identify his memorandum and to affirm that this was indeed his opinion. In his opinion, there was no case. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, issued its resolution finding a case in January of 2019. Thereafter, it went to the court, and on Valentine's Day, February 14th, Maria was arrested. So that's the time. They love me. The, that's the time of the events. From, from the filing in uh, 2018, January, until February 2019, to the arrest. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, we have a question from uh, Brian Wasuna from the Daily Nation in Kenya. Uh, Brian as well, feel free to jump on, but I'll, I'll pass your question. Uh, Maria, Brian is asking, uh, have the attacks by the government at any point gone beyond the court cases? Uh, have there been threats to your life as a result of your work? Uh, and particularly uh, the story at the center of the, of the cyber libel case. Uh, not the cyber libel case, uh, but uh, the, all of the attacks against Rappler began in 2016 with attacks on social media um, and uh, by government officials, President Duterte himself, then repeating, uh, and, and this goes back to, so let me just go over that timeline, right? In 2016, we came out with a, a weaponizing 
the internet weaponizing social media series, um, the propaganda war. And uh, I think that was the first time we, the second, I wrote two of the three part series and the second part was about how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. Uh, when, when we came out with that, exponential attacks, pro Duterte uh, uh, supporters and later government officials coming in attacking as many as 90 hate messages per hour. And then um, uh, a year later, the same narratives that were seeded on social media, it creates a bandwagon effect. So this is, this is part of the reason I think, you know, you, you cannot let a social media attack go un, unquestioned because it becomes fact. A lie told a million times becomes a fact in today's day and age. And a lie laced with anger and hate spreads fastest on social media. Those same narratives, Rappler being foreign owned, the basis then came out of President Duterte's own mouth about a year later in uh, July of 2017. And he didn't just say it to a newspaper or a television station. He said it in his State of the Nation address. And so I, re I immediately said, I was tweeting, live tweeting, and I said, Mr. President, you're wrong. And a week later, we got our first subpoena. So the weaponization of the law, the attacks on social media. And then by February of 2019, last year, we had uh, pro-Duterte people come to our office, uh, live streaming and, uh, and demanding essentially trying to dox us, publishing our address, telling people to come to our office, attack us, burn the office, uh, threats of beheading, line them up, firing squad and shoot them dead. I mean, this was taken down by Facebook after 24 hours, but you know, that line between inciting to hate online, jumping into the real world, this is a huge problem journalists have to deal with everywhere around the world. Yeah, maybe just a brief follow up from my side about that. I mean, how have you and your staff managed to deal with that situation? I mean, in terms of you know, specific safety precautions, but also, you know, psychologically, this, this constant barrage of hate messages and the ability that they can become real. Uh, and, and then the second part of that question, do you, has there been or would you expect to see a rise in this type of uh, online hate around the time of, your, of the verdict, for example? Hmm. So the, the first part of it is I, I, we dealt with it by acknowledging it was happening. You know, again, 2016, when this happened, our managing editor actually told me, Maria, maybe you shouldn't write the pieces because when you get attacked, our entire entire gets attacked. And for a little while, I didn't do these pieces, right? But that meant that the propaganda machine succeeded. But it was so disorienting because it was time this was a new weapon against journalists so what we did was we began to figure out what was happening data we looked at the data and that's the magic of of the internet right you can you can quantify the digital exhaust will be there and so we began digital forensics and um that's when we began a database. Now it's more than a terabyte. It looks at the entire information ecosystem of the Philippines. And the reason I can fight back and, and, and call them out, call the propaganda networks out, is because here, here's the data. And these networks have connected to geopolitical power play, Russian accounts as well as Chinese accounts. Right? So if you're interested in that, we can give you the data. Uh, the second thing is dealing with our people. In 2016, we, we sent our folks to counseling. Rappler is a startup. It started in 2012. And the median age in Rappler is 23 years old. It is 63% women. And our social media team and our reporters were bombarded with these attacks, right? The at the presidential palace, she was in her mid-20s when she was essentially bullied by President Duterte face-to-face. -face. So deal with that. Uh, we looked for counseling, but even the, the counselors in the Philippines, they hadn't really dealt with this kind of financial attacks that uh, preyed on you uh, and only you can see the full scope of the attacks. So we asked DART to come in and kind of do a train the trainers, but this is still a big thing. Here's the part that I think is, is difficult. 
that when we look at the data, the exponential attacks against women, the denigrating, misogynistic attacks, uh, women are attacked 10 times more than men on the average. That's difficult also because it changes values. Sorry, and maybe just, just one brief follow-up, another follow-up. I mean, from the data you have collected, I mean, what, what can you say about the level of organization of these uh, online attacks? I mean, is, is there something more behind it more than sort of, you know, random, random that you receive? Is, is, it more, is it more coordinated than that? It's extremely coordinated. It is so coordinated the original we've now counted at least six different waves of creation of, of accounts that work together and it is so coordinated that that first wave actually had three main content creators that uh, were targeting content to demographics so one account uh would target kind of like the the one percent of rich kind of thinking class and then the, there's one that would target middle class and then the mass base the anchor of the propaganda network is actually a singer dancer her name is Mo Son uh, she campaigned for President Duterte and then in April 2017 was given a government job and uh, remains in government today so her her focus was the mass base so it's um extremely um I can share the stories with you I'm sure a lot of my friends here are tired of me speaking about this but the reason why i think this is incredibly important is because journalists have lost our gatekeeping powers our distribution which used to be part of news organizations has now been taken away by technology and technology has been the enabler of the rise of these authoritarian style leaders and as early as november 2017 studies have shown and the freedom house was the first one studies have shown that these chief armies on social media uh, essentially push democracy back. And that's in many countries around the world. In 2017, the count was 28. Oxford Computational Propaganda Research Project doubled that the next year. And 2019 is up at like 70 or 80. So this is not a problem that we can solve in the Philippines, but the Global South bears the brunt of the decisions that are made in Silicon Valley. In Myanmar, you have had uh, killings that have happened, it's essentially, it's close to genocide, right? I mean, I don't even know what to call it, but uh, there hasn't been enough done. And I call one of our young reporters is also on this call, Bea Kupin. Uh, she's, she covered the police and now is doing lifestyle and entertainment. But, you know, she, she, she's had to deal with these attacks. So these are some of the, the things that we need to address as we move forward, and it is a global problem. I just see one uh, question, I think, from Stephanie, just about the name of the singer that you mentioned. If, if you, maybe, you, Maria, you wouldn't mind typing it into the chat. Uh, that would sure, be, I'll type it in. Just a moment. Um, then we have a couple of questions, also one that was sent to us uh, before the call. It's from, from David Walmsley of the Globe and Mail, um, asking uh, about and also, David, of course, uh, feel free to, to jump on as well by voice if you want. But uh, the question was, uh, you know, what do you want international, your international colleagues to do? You know, how can, how can uh, the international community best help? Uh, and there was a connected question to that, not, not from David, but somebody else had asked. Um, but I think it's, it's related. You know, does international criticism or condemnation um, bother Duterte, uh, does he react to it? So maybe if you would like to pick up uh, either of those, those points. Ted, you first, and then I will, I'll answer some of the questions also here, and I'll send you some links on this. Let me take, let me take the second one. Uh, does international condemnation bother him? He, he, he projects that he isn't phased by it, but uh, recently, some of the some of the things that he's done would indicate that he he does he does get affected. Uh, he has made certain decisions that would indicate that you know he he wants to project that he's he's his own man, he's independent thinking, 
for example, he he abrogated uh, almost unilaterally without consulting the military, the enforcement in the United States and the Philippines. I think that previous presidents had worked very hard to get from the United States, and so he abrogates it. Uh, and 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 and, and the, well, while it may not be directly connected, uh, of course. Because of the timing, anecdotally, people connected it because he abrogated be because uh, one of his, you know, favorite uh, former uh, adjutants, the former chief of the police, who is now a senator, uh, you know, had had his visa revoked, and you know, a few days later, remember, but you know, almost immediately after, soon after, he said, you know, no more, no more VFA. Right, no more VFA, and so you know people people equate that. You know, was this senator uh, had his visa revoked by the U.S. Duterte cancels the the visiting force agreement. Very recently, during lockdown during the pandemic, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs walks that back and says, "We are now suspending the abrogation between the Philippines and the U.S." He he does seem to project. Which it doesn't care, but it is getting to him, and you know he has he's been making certain moves that would appear to show that he he does acknowledge that there is criticism, but uh, his immediate his almost immediate reaction whenever he gets criticism from particularly last and then makes a policy. He his policies usually are verbal; very few of them are written down. He announces it in the uh, he or he in one of his press conferences, and his staff then you know scramble to come up with a written order that reflects what he said. And so his usual response is he 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 lashes out when there's foreign criticism, uh, uses foul language, and then his people try to walk it back. So that that's 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 a, that's a dynamic there. And, I uh, don't. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Do you want to add anything to that, Maria? Sorry, I dumped a lot of links there. Could you remind me again what what the what the question was? Yeah, the question was just about um, you know what, what you would what in your view is is helpful from from international oh. colleagues. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, of course. And, and then um, and then the question of you know does does it actually have an effect? Does international condemnation have an effect? So I, I think it was David who, who asked that, right? Um, I have to say thank you, because I think we are, we in Rappler have been uh, helped tremendously by the stories that you do. The only defense we need in these types of situations is to keep doing the story, because uh, you have to shine the light. And that actually does, when you shine the light, it elicits better behavior. So yes, uh, we did the stories. The first one that we tried to do was to look at impunity, right? impunity in the drug war. And uh, initially the reaction was to change the way numbers were being reported. But um, what we're seeing is while it continues, the number of, of killings at least have slowed down, right? Uh, and then um, I guess Ted talked to you about how the one senator who was the, the chief architect, he was the, the chief of the Philippine National Police when the drug war began, his visa was, uh, was re pulled back under the area by the U.S. government. And then the government reacted to that immediately and tried to cancel the visiting forces agreement, which it then just reinstated a week ago. It just basically said, no, forget it. We'll keep going. I think it hangs a Damocles sword. Uh, but the way we've fought back and the way we can keep doing our jobs is by to keep telling stories, to keep telling stories. And you telling our story helps us stay alive. Thanks, Maria. And, and just on that note, actually, IPI has started a campaign this week uh, in advance of the verdict. Um, I'll put a link there as well. Oh, sorry, that was just to... So I've, I've put a link there in the chat, and as you see, you know, the IPI Executive Board 
um, is, has put out a statement of support for Maria and, and many of our board members this week are publishing big statements of support and we're also uh, encouraging our, our members and committees uh, to send letters to the Philippines embassies, I think, you know, to show that actually uh, there is concern and care about your case uh, all over the world uh, and the journalists watching. Um, so, so, so we're glad that our members are, are taking part in that campaign. Um, I see from Juni, so I'll ask uh, my, my colleagues as well to switch you on. Hi, everybody. Whoops, I'm so sorry. Let me just change my background. Just a second. I recognize that background. We were just on a call this morning uh, for another program that we run. I'm Juni Lau from uh, One Ifra. Um, I have a question actually about law. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, for those of us who are not familiar with uh, legal procedure in the Philippines, uh, take us through the steps as to, you know, what uh, would, you know, what can we expect? Uh, you know, in, in, the, in this case, and my other question is really, uh, does this law that Maria is charged uh, under have retrospective effect at all? No, okay. it um, shouldn't. <laughs> Go tell. <laughs> I mean, sometimes okay, it's possible right. to legislate, you know, for the effect of, of the law but, um, retrospectively, but in this yes. case, is, does the law say so? <clears throat> okay. In the Philippines, we, we have a system that's a bit strange. We have a blended system. Uh, others would say it's a mixed system. Our, our procedure is taken from the U.S., but our substantive law, both criminal and civil laws, are taken from the Spanish codes. So it's a very strange mix. So in this case, it's a criminal case. So our, our penal code is taken from the Spanish code. And... <clears throat> particular offense cyber libel it came out in 2012 only it basically says that all offenses that are existing as of 2012 if you commit them using an ICT device then it becomes a cyber offense if you kill someone using a, an ICT device it becomes cyber murder and so our joke there in class is how do you commit cyber murder you hit someone with a laptop basically so that's cyber murder Right, but that's how strange the law is. All offenses can become a cyber offense if you commit it using an ICT device. So that's the definition of cyber libel here. It's ordinary libel, the defamation offenses that we know as libel become a cyber offense if it's committed online using a computer, using the technology, using internet. Now, in this case, we don't have a grand jury like the US. We have, we have, we don't have a jury either. We have a single judge besides all facts and all questions of law. Judge also is the one who hands down the, the verdict and determines the sentence. So everything is on this judge, just one judge. And the, there is a prosecutor. The prosecutor is a public prosecutor. And then of course there are defense counsels. One thing we do have that's different from other jurisdictions what we call a prosecutor. The, the lawyer of the complainant is allowed to directly intervene in the prosecution of the case. So in this situation, we did have private prosecutors. In fact, there were three sets of private prosecutors plus two public prosecutors from the DOJ. So you can imagine that's an ho a whole army of lawyers uh, against uh, two accused and one company they're trying to hold liable. So uh, ordinarily, tr criminal cases in the Philippines take take. Uh, it, it's it's been known it's been known to be slow. This case is, I think, an exception. Uh, the judge was particularly efficient, uh, very clear in procedure, and that's why we're done. You know, very, you know. We, we started in Feb, sometime in March, and so we're about to conclude uh, in, in June. We would have concluded in April, if not for the lockdown. The initial date was April 3rd. And so 
that's the procedure. What will happen on Monday? What will happen on Monday is that when the court is called to order, uh, she will then read publicly the verdict from her bench. Well, she'll ask her clerk of court to read, read from the bench. And once the announced, of course, that can, I, that can either be acquittal or eviction. And so if it is acquittal, then it's over. Uh, there is, the prosecution can no longer appeal the acquittal because the, uh, the Constitution provides for a guarantee against double jeopardy. So uh, once it is, the accused is acquitted, then that's it. That's over. But if there is a conviction, uh, mm -hmm. what will happen next is that there is a possibility, of course, that the accused will, will be deprived of bail, depending on the length of the sentence. But since this particular offense is a bailable offense, what we will do in the event of a conviction is to ask for bail, meaning that uh, Maria and Ray, the, the two accused, should be allowed to go free on the same amount of bail that they've already posted. And uh, I, do, I don't see any, you know, any difficulty in, in asking for that. If ever, the only possible complication would be that probably the judge would ask for a higher amount of bail if, if she wants to. Do the accused uh, have a right uh, to appeal the, the yes. conviction? Yes. It is appealable, okay. Yes, it is appealable. Uh, and therefore, there's pending appeal yes the bail should okay. be should would be granted pending appeal and right. so that would be the next step assuming a conviction we would definitely appeal the case uh, initially to the court of appeals and then from the court of appeals should there be a you know another adverse judgment we'd go all the way to the supreme court uh of course the, these are questions both of fact and law because again we have a single system we don't have a panel so uh, all questions of law would be open. And so, and so that's it. And I think your second question had to deal with... Was on a retrospective application of the law. Yes. Uh, as a general principle, uh, our, our criminal laws are prospective in nature. The exactly. only time that they, uh, they will retroactively is if they are favorable to the accused. So mm -hmm. and I'll give an example. So let's assume a, let's assume a conviction for cyber libel. And then maybe, let's say, next year, Congress passes a law saying cyber libel is repealed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That conviction disappears because that's, that's favorable to favorable. the accused. But otherwise, it's prospective. Right. So in this case, it's a retrospective or retroactive application of the law. Well, no, not really. Not, not, really, not really directly, okay? But uh, our Publish. argument, yes, our argument is that... Uh, the, the, the offense has prescribed because they should have filed in 2012, exactly. not, uh, not in 2018. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. then can I, can I just say one of the internal things that we've talked about a lot is that, you know, the difference before and after a conviction is that before a conviction, a bailable charge uh, is bailable. You don't, you are granted bail. Uh, you must. After a conviction, it's up to the discretion of the judge to grant bail. So I'm holding on to Ted's reassurance that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I should be granted bail, but that it is still at the judge's discretion. And I will say lots of things that have never happened before have happened. And so I, I want to go in eyes wide open. I don't want to be surprised. Not negatively anyway. We'll be watching. Thank you very much. Indeed, we will be watching. Uh, thanks. I think that it was, was really useful to, to walk through that. Um, I've got another question, a follow-up question from, from Brian from the, Daily Ma from the Daily Nation in Kenya. Uh, he, he's asking again, I think, uh, how independent are the courts in the Philippines? Uh, um, and the, the, he asked the question, how, how many times have the courts ruled against journalists in cases uh, amount to stifling of, of press freedoms? Before you go to the law professor, uh, I will really just tell you that the ABS-CBN, the largest network, has been shut down. So that's, um, uh, I think, uh, a clear sign of the times. Ted, the answers to the journalists. You're muted. I'm muted. I'm sorry. Uh, 
this the second question how many times have the courts ruled against journalists in a way that uh in cases that amount to stifling of press freedoms you know i i'd say on 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 average there are not too many cases directly involving journalists who have been charged with uh performing their duties uh the the way that press freedom is threatened in the philippines is not really by filing of cases uh there there are there have been journalists who have been killed threatened not directly by court judgments the closest i think up to that was when the the husband of the former president uh president arroyo filed a series of libel cases against journalists for writing you know articles that were that he found uh, defamatory that he thought was defamatory but he pulled them out uh, well due to public pressure as well because the journalists basically uh, didn't uh, let him you know didn't give him any 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 peace so he basically withdrew but that was the closest Uh the reason why I say this is because the Supreme Court has ruled over and over again that press freedom is a preferred right in the Philippines. And so because that's the Supreme Court saying it, most of the trial courts would have to follow that precedent. And so in terms of actual cases, not many people bother to file cases against journalists. They they if they have a beef against journalists, they just you know, they don't file cases. They do something else. So this particular verdict is is pretty much uh it, it's 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 interesting because again this is clearly a, a a journalist uh on television and the offense is a content based offense uh probably in terms of libel involving journalists we would say most of them involve civil damages uh large amounts of damages filed in court in terms of criminal libel i can probably name one or two involving entertainment reporters not uh, not news reporters but entertainment reporters uh being sued by uh movie stars but basically that's it okay hope that answers uh, the question for you there uh brian um Maybe just a last reminder to people: if you have any last questions uh, for Maria and Ted, uh, to please go ahead and either raise your hand uh, or put your question in the chat. As I think slowly we'll uh, start to wrap up because I, I know it's getting quite late uh, there. I mean, Maria, maybe just sort of a final question from my side. You mentioned, you know, we have the ABS closure recently. Uh, now you've mentioned also in this uh, this anti-terror bill. Uh, which Duterte is, is poised to sign, and which may uh, people who publish critical content could be considered as terrorists. And, and for IPI, unfortunately, that's nothing new. It's something we see, you know, around the world. And I just want to ask you a bit. You know, over the past few months, we've seen COVID and the pandemic, and, and now these closures and new laws. How do you see the situation progressing in the Philippines? I mean, are you? Do you think things are going to get? worse still uh, in terms of press freedom um, oh maybe. lord um i think you know i i started the this conversation by saying that this is this is i think our an existential moment for us for our democracy and uh, a lot of that is because we've been seeing our the walls come closing in um it's like death by a thousand cuts right of of the of our democracy and um and actually that phrase a thousand cuts is the title of a documentary film that uh, that made it to sundance uh this year it's a thousand cuts and uh the cuts have only gotten deeper um but the upside here's a silver lining in the covid-19 um there was a lot of fear before the way that The administration got things moving. What I call it—I used to call it the three C's: corrupt, coerce, co-op. Right. But during the lockdown, with the draconian measures, um, we saw Filipinos starting to speak up. And then there was real fear again when the anti-terror bill—I mean, 
it passed the House of Representatives in about five days. And Ted can talk more about this because Flag is a main campaigner against it. So I guess, uh, you know, this weekend, if you're in the Philippines, you can see what we have gone through in the last, you know, since, since the Duterte administration took office um, in, in the film, A Thousand Cuts. It will play for the first time online in the Philippines. Uh, it's showing in different uh, parts of the world in, in documentary festivals. But when you watch it, uh, it it's shocking how we get from here to here. Uh, and now I think we're at this moment where if we don't stand up to protect rights, obviously I have, and I've been punished for it. Um, and I was a cautionary tale for other journalists. Um, so there are consequences to it. But I think, I think if, we don't, if we don't reclaim our rights, we'll lose it. And you will see the Philippines fundamentally change. Uh, Ted, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that or if you have any comments also in particular about this anti-terror bill as it seems to be a quite urgent and, and current issue just to make it close. Well, we can't hear you actually. I think. Oh, you're, you're muted, Ted. Yeah. You're muted, sorry. This Friday is Independence Day in the Philippines. And so you're going to see a lot of pushback online because with current restrictions you're not allowed to uh, gather together the limit uh, the, the presidential spokesperson said the limit is 10 people but of course that's not going to happen the people are going to mass up together and part of the part of the things that they're going to be talking about is the the anti-terror bill and what, one thing that makes this bill particularly dangerous is the the definition the, I mean, across you know, jurisdictions, terrorism has, has always been very difficult to define. But uh, this particular definition is, is both expansive as well as vague because it, it basically says any act that is committed with the intent of harming someone, if it produces intimidation to a large degree of the populace, then that's terrorism. It's as vague as that. It's as expansive as that. So uh, that's what's gotten people worried. And another, another aspect of it, of course, is the power that's been given to, a, to an executive body called the Anti-Terrorism Council, composed of eight cabinet members. Uh, it's an ex purely executive body. And one of the powers given to that executive body is the power to order arrests without warrants and to detain people for up to 24 days without a warrant and without needing to file charges. You know? uh, and pe people in the Philippines remember the bad old days when we were under martial law, under Marcos, when we had executive orders ar to arrest people. Under our constitution now, arrests can only be made by court order. Only a judge can order an arrest. And so you, know, you have to wonder, how do they think they're going to get away with this when the constitution is so absolutely clear? You know, so that's, that's what people are worried about, that if they would put a provision in a law and Congress would pass it, knowing that the constitution doesn't allow it, what do they know that we don't know? Right? And so that's why people are speaking out, speaking out. For the first time, we've seen business people, business groups writing a very strong statement protesting it. Business groups are usually the, the most quiet when it comes to these things. Had business groups coming out and saying, no, we do not want the terror bill. So, 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 so that's gotten people worried. And on top of the pandemic, people are saying, we don't need this. And so uh, we're going to be very closely monitoring what's going to happen when the president does sign it. We do expect a lot of challenges. We do expect a lot of cases that will be filed. And well, we will we will just continue to do our job. Thanks a lot. Um, I think it's it's getting late, so we'll we'll let you and and Ted uh, go, uh, Maria. But uh, yeah, I want to thank you both again for, for taking the time uh, to have this conversation, and, and also thanks to everyone who joined uh, for 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 joining as well and for the questions. 
Um, Maria, I think we are just uh, wishing you all the best, obviously, from Monday. I think, yeah, you have a lot of people around the world who are, who are backing you, obviously. Um, and I would just encourage everyone, again, put some links here in the chat to, uh, we're, we'll be posting videos and, and, and messages of support all this week. So please, um, you know, anyone feel free to, to share those because uh, I think we really want to show the Philippines that uh, the international community and the journalistic community as well around the world is, is watching this case very closely and cares about what happens to you and, and Rappler. Uh, so again, thanks so much for, for being here and yeah, all the best for, for Monday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks everybody for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody.